of minutes. I, okay. I'm recording now, so. Yeah. Why I? <laughs> okay. <Do you? laughs> so yeah, welcome to Art and Culture Guild, and uh, we're gonna start with introducing ourselves, I guess. Um, so I'm Yulia. I'm an artist, fashion designer, um, NFT enthusiast. I've started being actively involved in the NFT space since the beginning of last year. Uh, and I organized like NFT art shows. I'm doing creative direction for NFT projects and also kind of like collecting trading <laughs> and learning a lot through that. Um, so that's me and Ben. Hello. Um... I tried to give my intro by words. <laughs> so my nouns are that I am a strategist in marketing by day, but I also moonlight as someone that's super interested in a DAO contributor. Um, basically, I just am super interested in crypto X culture because I kind of work in advertising, which is the act of commercializing culture. But that's a a different conversation for a different day. Um, yeah, very excited for this. I already gave a little bit of an intro earlier. Reach out, DM, questions, all that. Very excited for today's uh, presentation. Back to you. Uh, yeah. So first, we're gonna just like talk through like what kind of structure we will have for this guild, and then we're gonna skip to the first presentation. So we're gonna have three sessions. The we kind of name them as past, present, and future. So we're going to cover the past today, and it will be the presentation on NFTs in the context of history of art and technology, because I always feel it's very interesting to look at the past to understand the present better, but we will also look at the present uh, use cases of NFTs and how we can use this technology. So second session will be led by Ben. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. we're going like, to cover marketing and community building for NFT projects. And uh, the third session uh, will be discovering, like discussing the future of NFTs and where it can all lead and where do we want it to head in general. Uh, so here is like our structure will be only not only the sessions, but we will also have a mirror board dedicated to the guild. So part of this mirror board is an inspiration board and you can see the screen show. Uh, we're gonna drop the link, I guess, in the chat and also like in the Slack channel. And if you haven't already join us in the Slack channel, it's hashtag guild culture. And in this inspiration board, please feel free to add anything that you find interesting that you come across. So it's our common area to exchange ideas and to keep it all together because in the Slack you can easily like lose all these links that people are sharing. And I feel it's very important to kind of, because there are so many things going on, it's hard to keep track. Uh, so I made like several topics, but you can also like suggest if you want like a separate area for something else. Uh, besides it, there is also the NFT knowledge base on the same mirror board. Um, because we're not going to talk so much about like technical aspects of NFT or like how to code a smart contract. Uh, everybody's here on a different levels, but we have it all in our knowledge base. So if you want to read up on something, uh, you will find all this information. And also, it's also like interactive. So whatever you want to add to this board, please feel free to add. Just don't uh, delete whatever somebody else puts in there. Um, and we're going to start with the presentation. So NFTs in the context of history of art and technology. It's a very long name, <laughs> but I feel it's representing what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, um, I guess like most of you knows what NFTs are, but I'm going to do a little bit of introduction. Uh, so I believe that blockchain is one of the most exciting and important technological innovations of our time. And it's continues to reimagine in a lot of existing structures, for example, finance, governance, art, and gaming. And NFTs are one of the most interesting use cases, uh, which are also called non-fungible tokens. Uh, so as Super Air says that blockchains provide a powerful platform on which to build a fairer and more equitable creator economy. So um, in a lot of ways, NFTs disrupt the traditional art market where quite often 
uh, access is gatekept by a selected few, and statistically, it's usually white male elite from a certain countries with a certain education. So NFT space opened the access pro for artists from all over the world to share their works and uh, get more well known. So first, I want to travel back in time and kind of uh, research and understand this um, connection of art and technology. Uh, because analyzing past trends and cycles helps us to understand the present. So art and technology were always interconnected and they influenced each other over each historical period. And when I say technology, I don't mean only contemporary technology. I use it in a more broader sense in, uh, I guess, a term that you can find the vocabulary, which means practically, especially industrial use of scientific discoveries. And basically technology is everything that you use in your daily life, like even like tables and, <laughs> Uh, cups, it's all like made with a certain technologies. So I'm using this term in a broader sense, not only digital. Um, so first I wanna cover certain discoveries and their connection with the art styles or art forums. Uh, so first we can go back to, I mean, obviously there will be a lot of, a lot of examples, but I just picked a few um, to let us like to direct our thinking in a certain way. So for example, in painting, uh, the invention of the flat brushes and tube paints were one of the things that allowed impressionism. So we can think about this, that if this technology didn't exist or it was a bit different, like a different style of painting would be evolving. Uh, so uh, this kind of thinking is like medium native thinking. So for example, Renoir said that without tubes of paint, there would be no impressionism. So for many years, artists would make their own paints, so already made uh, paints were not available. And they would, um, so they had like a very short term time when they will be like, uh, were able to kept. So when the paint tube was invented in the 19th century, it made it possible for easy transportation of for paints for working outdoors and it led to mass production. Um, and thus people were able to go outdoors and paint plain air. So the same thing with the flat brushes. Flat brushes were not available, but when they were invented, uh, it led to a new direction of and form of art and a new style in art because it helped impressionists to do these broad strokes that they are famous for. Uh, then acrylic paint was invented in the middle of last century, 20th century. Um, and acrylic pa paint also led to different uh, art styles. So for example, Jackson Pollock was one of the few people who learned about acrylics in the workshop and it led him to his famous dripping and pouring technique. Um, a lot of artists of our time experimented with this technique, for example, Mark Rothko and Roy Lichtenstein. And uh, the person that made acrylics famous is Andy Warhol because um, he made this series of Campbell soup cans and it demonstrated the sharp and bold clarity that is possible with this style. Uh, I always think that if Andy Warhol was alive, he would make the best NFTs because he seemed to be like such a, um, like a visionary and he always saw this new technologies and how can you use them. So acrylics became the staple point for the pop art movement. Uh, then photography is the whole style that is basically was born from a technological progress. Um, and if we travel back in time, I always thought the technology was invented later, but actually it was invented in the middle of 19th century. Um, and in the beginning, it took a long time to, to make a photos. And um, so the first uh, photography as, as we know it was born in 1839. Uh, and it only acquired like minutes of exposure in the front of the camera. And it's also interesting to know that contemporaries of the time, they kind of like were really interested in the photography, but they didn't, they were not sure about how it will evolve and if it can, you know, like substitute oil painting at the time. Uh, so with the photography, also the next important development that was 
uh, that made photography as we know it possible is a mass production of roll films in the mid 20th century. It allowed amateurs to take pictures in natural color and in black and white and allowed more people to practice it. And then in the 1990s, uh, the electronic digital cameras revolutionized photography. And um, people started switching to digital cameras more and more. And then when cameras became a standard feature on the smartphone, uh, I think like now we can agree that it's one of the most widely practiced art form. Like quite often people take pictures and don't even think of it as art. Uh, and then video art is also something that was only made possible with a certain technologies. So in the 1960s, when the consumer video technology such as videotape recorders and um, became more available to people, so artists started experimenting with it. Also, it's quite interesting when this art style evolved, a lot of contemporary art museums didn't consider it to be viable art form. So they didn't want to show it. And they thought that this loud video art kind of disrupts the pristine white galleries. So it took like 30 years for art museums to recognize video art as an art form. And also I think it's in a way it's happening with NFTs because even though they are like sold at Christie's and Sotheby's, I find that a lot of art critics still are quite skeptical about the value of NFTs as art form. Uh, so one of the first pioneers who made video art is the German artist uh, Wolf Wostel. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly. So he was the first one to incorporate TV sets in his happenings and installations. Uh, but actually quite interesting that again, Workle was the one who <laughs> made it famous by releasing a piece called Blowjob in 1964. Uh, and the photo that you see is Nam Jun Pine, who was also like probably the most famous pioneer of video art movement. Um, so this little trip back down the history uh, introduces us to the thought of what is medium native. Like all of these art forms and art styles were using a certain invention, certain technology and were possible because of that. So now we can start thinking, uh, what is medium native or technology native for NFTs? So let's look now at what NFTs are and some of their key features and benefits to kind of start thinking in the direction what is medium native with NFTs. Um, so a little bit uh, of term. Non-fungible tokens represent ownership of unique items on the blockchain. Uh, they let us tokenize digital art, collectibles, game items, domain names, and metaverse land parcels. Uh, Non-fungible in the name means that they are not interchangeable for other items. And just because of this unique property, it allows us to track unique ownership of digital assets, which actually allows us a lot of interesting things that we can do with it in the future. So here are some features or what you can call it benefits of NFTs. Uh, again, each of them can lead us to use one of this in our projects and in things that we do. The first one is verifiability. It means that everyone can access the blockchain and verify who's the real owner of this or that NFT. Obviously, like it's, it's not connected to the passport name, but it gives us the opportunity like automated verification applications like Collabland, for example. And we, with the use of that and with verifying who owns the NFT, we can create token gated community, token gated X content and um, white lists for certain like owners of NFTs and so on. Uh, the next one is accessibility. So it means that content creators from all over the world, regardless of their age, gender and nationality can sell their creations on the blockchain as soon as they learn how to use it, <laughs> which is sometimes a little bit of uh, complexity, but uh, still it's uh, possible for people from all over the world. And also the digital nature of assets allow us an instant trade 
without the complexity of shipping and getting a permission from centralized gatekeepers. So if anyone ever sold paintings and dealt with the pain of sending them or shipping them to another country knows what I'm talking about. Uh, another important part is royalties and IP. Uh, so artists receive direct royalties from each resale of their work and also they can choose to retain IP of their creations or make it public for, for example, like cryptos made the IP public and it means that anyone can use these creations. So it kind of like this decision about IP also makes it and becomes an art statement. Do we want to share an IP? Do we want to like give an IP just for one of the artworks that the person buys? Um, and also because of the royalties, uh, yeah, like not because of the royalties, but because of the financial structure of NFTs, you get a bigger share from primary sales because in the primary traditional market, you give a big chunk to art galleries, art dealers, music, uh, record labels, and so on. Uh, and that leads us to exploration because each part of NFT creation, selling and ownership potentially presents an opportunity for experimentation. So there are different moving parts. The first one is a smart contract, smart contract that uh, we make in order to make to mint NFTs on the blockchain. So custom smart contracts allow us to design NFT behavior, program automatic royalties between multiple creators and so much more. The next part is a token. So you can choose your token format, for example, to mitigate minting gas expenses. Uh, I made a typo here. So there is a new format that is called RC721A. Uh, you will find the video for it on a mirror board. It's quite new. So quite a few people are using it, but it's quite interesting because it uh, lowers the cost needed compared to previous formats. Or you can assign trades to your, uh, to your tokens and metadata and all these trades are doing certain like special meaning, they have special things. So I feel there are also like a lot of creative decisions that can be made with choosing your token format. Um, Another part is a minting experience. Because be besides focusing on arts itself, like how can you make a minting experience fun and interesting? Uh, a lot of NFT launches now are either like a stressful grind for a whitelist and the opportunity to be the first one to mint, or it's a gas war where only people who either have a lot of money or have or both like have a lot of understanding how minting works, how to win the gas war. Uh, so how can you make it more fun? Maybe you can turn it into a game itself. Not so many people do it. Um, I feel quite often the most fair model is given uh, the access to your previous collectors and then giving them a certain time, uh, time window, like for example, 24 hours to mint. Uh, but there are certain projects, for example, in, back in summer, the project called Crypto Corbis, uh launched, and they had this fun game for 24 hours when Corgis appeared on a blockchain and you had like, I don't remember, like one hour to save them. It means that you mean them and then you save them or otherwise they die. But this during this one hour, the price dropped. So you kind of want to want to buy them in the last moment for the lowest price, but also like you have this fear that maybe it will take too long and they're going to die. Uh, and I feel it, it created both like um, fair distribution, a lot of, um, so there were not so many people who owned a large chunk of them, uh, but also it kind of like made it gamified for the creators, uh, for the collectors. And also, um, there is a future roadmap. I don't believe that NFT, like every NFT project or artwork needs a roadmap. Uh, now there are a lot of, I feel especially last several months, like last six months, there are so many talks about roadmaps and like especially artists feel a lot of pressure that they need to introduce utility to their tokens. And like, how do you introduce utility when it's like the utility is art? But if you want to do it uh, and you feel that your project needs a roadmap, then it's also like opens us 
gives us a lot of opportunities to be creative and to make all the stages and make it like gamify the whole experience and use utilize medium native features. Uh, so here I, I give example of Adidas originals. I think they made a really good example of how a big brand can enter NFT space in more crypto native way, but also like respecting the existing communities. Uh, they launched together with uh, several big um, existing projects like Punk's Comic, Bored Apes, and uh, um, also G Money, who's like a big collector in the NFT space. And they did it like in a very respectful way. So they, they watched the space for some time, they understood what to do, and they uh, introducing now this gamified rollout of physical products together with the digital products and the future like metaverse activities. Um, I think their roadmap is a bit, uh, is not fully announced yet, but uh, like, yeah, if you're looking for a strategy for a bigger brand, I think this is a really good example how um, to do it. Uh, so one of the, uh, now I'm gonna cover different parts of different ways to use NFTs or to mint NFTs and make crypto art in medium native way. Uh, so one of them is on-chain art. So most NFTs, they just point to a location where information is stored, for example, IPFS. Uh, while on-chain artworks are, are tokens, are artworks themselves. So one of the benefits of this solution is that it makes it, the art as immutable as Ethereum network itself, while in other cases, the longevity of NFT data depends on longevity of IPFS. So, there are quite a lot of talks about it. And um, I mean, we don't know how long IPFS is gonna exist. So th there were a few cases uh, with all the NFTs where the data for NFT would disappear because something happened to either blockchain where it was stored or um, to, um, to a storage system. So, but also it's, even though I'm talking about it, it's important to understand that storing information on the blockchain is quite expensive. So obviously not all art can be minted on chain. So for example, heavy visual files or like 3D art or like long form texts, uh, it just doesn't make sense to store it on a blockchain rather than an art statement. So this is one of the examples. It's um, Autoglyph by Larva Labs and the whole data for this work is stored on chain. Uh, so it can be like fully recreated from, from the contract. And here uh, I shared some of the other examples. Obviously there are so much more, but I found some interesting examples how people are making art on chain. So one of the projects was Ether Poems and it was poetry that was minted on chain. So they, they had this picture that you see here um, in the top left corner. So they had pictures for each of the poetry, but the text of the poetry was also stored on chain. And if you look up at their contract and you can put in the token ID and it returns uh, the poem. So I think it was, uh, I mean, there was some discussions whether it was the first fully on chain poetry or not, but they claimed that they are first fully on chain. Um, poetry contract. So another one, uh, another project that uh, just finished not so long ago, it's a Chain Faces Air Arena. And if you were not following it, um, it was the successor to original on-chain text faces that uh, look like the work in the middle without the scars. And they introduced this concept of the battle arena that I think was probably um, inspired by Squid Game. Um, and so all the artworks were um, joined this battle, were able to join this battle arena when they will be fighting against each other. There was no real fight. So it was like a randomness, whoever wins and whoever like went through the round, they got this scar and each of these action happened on chain. So the one that you see it has a lot of scars. It means it won 
a lot of battles and survived a lot. Um, and then there was like a huge money prize for whoever wins it. But uh, yeah, but obviously <laughs> out of, I, I don't remember if it was, if it was like 10,000 works, uh, 10,000 NFTs or 20,000. So obviously most of them didn't survive it. But I feel it's very interesting because all of the sections were like coded and recorded on chain. Uh, another example is Neolastics and also it's um, uh, like fully on chain artwork. Uh, another type of using NFTs and like the technical possibilities creatively is a uh, creative use of smart contracts, which uh, I'm interested in a lot. Mm. So the question is, how can you design a smart contract so it becomes our statement in itself? Uh, so there are so many like ways how it can be used creatively. For example, it can be uh, made as a conceptual art piece when the contract itself becomes an, like an art statement, or it can be a secret signature that you put into the smart contract code, or um, there is a lot of different models of fair distributions of the royalties between creators and collectors. For example, the royalties can be either distributed between several artists who are taking part in it, or you can assign the royalties to your future collectors as well and transfer or like the NFT can have certain trades and people who own the NFT with these trades receive the part of the royalties. So there are a lot of ways how can distributing, distribution of the royalties become part of the create, creative uh, statement of the artwork. So one, a few people who are exploring creative smart contracts that are interesting to look at is uh, Park and Raya Mata, Myers. They're a great source of inspirations um, for conceptual art pieces. Uh, Park has a lot of works that can be looked at it. Uh, and he's like very minimalistic and very conceptual. So for example, his recent work, uh, Hate, was uh, only people who um, posted something hateful about him on Twitter were able to mean these artworks. And then they, when they all got this exclusive artworks, they find out that they can't do anything with them. They can't transfer them. They can't sell them. They can't burn it. So the only person that was able to do anything with this artwork was Puck themselves. So I feel like the, this whole concept, it wasn't about how NFT looked like, but the whole idea, like the whole concept of what he created with it. Um, another interesting concept are artworks that are programmed to change over time. For example, the artwork can evolve over time, or maybe there are outside triggers, like uh, what if um, the Ethereum um, exchange rate changes, then something happens with the artwork or based on the change of seasons or based on the change of day and night cycles. So you can all like program all of it into the um, NFT. Uh, the artwork that is, I used here as an example was um, actually it, it is the biggest sale by living creator. Uh, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken it was launched in september by park and it's called merged so also it's fully on chain and basically the artwork looks like this <laughs> like a white circle sometimes it's a blue circle or yellow circle which are more rare uh, but it was interesting like he launched it as a game for their collectors so when you have like buy another artwork like this it accumulates mass so every artwork has its mass and you start from a very small and then you collect more and this circle grows, uh, which is again, is more like conceptual art rather than something visual. So I shared some of the examples here, for example, uh, Mutant Garden Cedar, Cedar, which was launched last year. Uh, when one of this artwork is minted, the transaction hash of the current Ethereum block is taken as a seed and this seed determines both, both the appearance of the artwork and also the frequency of its mutation. So this is the type of the artwork that changes and evolves over time. Uh, and the result is growing sequence of SVG files 
of the birth and mutation states uh, that actually can be calculated. So the next one is this contract is art. Ray Myers, um, she made it uh, as an Ethereum application in back in 2014, 2015. Uh, I dropped her website in on the in mirror board because I find like, yeah, like for anyone who is interested in conceptual art, you can find a lot of interesting use cases and uh, inspiration there. So this um, Ethereum application is a contract that can be instructed to nominate itself as art or not. So whoever like toggles this contract state changes it. The basically the the name says either the contract is art or this contract is not art. Um, so it's a conceptual art that takes ideas of dematerialization. So the art that is not presented in a fixed physical form and nomination, something that is art because something, someone or something says it is and combines them into um, uh, this interactive artwork that exists and interferes with network protocols. Um, I, I feel like this artwork is very interesting because it's kind of like this discusses what is art. There was so many discussions about it, like how you can call something art, like who says it is art and this is not art. So it's quite an interesting concept. Uh, then here you can see the examples of how you can sneak in different artworks into the smart contracts code itself. So again, it's Park and Julian Assange. Uh, and it's part of their contract for the censored artwork. So basically they, they made this image that looks like an artwork they minted, but it's inside the contract. So it's something that is not visible for most of the people, but it's kind of like, you know, like a secret signature on the back of the canvas. Um, another very interesting example is like, I, example, I really love this artwork. It was made in spring last year, but, by Mad Dog Jones, and it's called the Replicator. So he used the smart contract to create a self-generating piece that will continue continue to create new discrete NFTs over the course of approximately one year. So there will be seven generations of the artwork, and each generation makes. Um, I don't remember. Like I think the first generation makes like six artworks, and each next generation makes one less artwork than the previous one. But what's interesting, uh, this artwork has the probability of getting jammed like a real replicator. So there is this chance in works algorithm that it's not gonna create new artworks. Um, I think the percentage was like, oh, I, I forgot like 40, 60% or something like that, or maybe less. Uh, so this jam also comes in the form of jam artwork. Uh, that can stop a generator. So I think it's very interesting because it's quite a cool piece of animated visual art that um, also like this, this is a video like the clock changes over time and it's like there is a day and night and this printer working, but also the fact that it creates new NFTs itself. Mm, uh, okay, the next one is the one that probably most of you are very familiar with uh, because it became so popular last year is generative art. So what is generative art? It's an art program using a computer that intentionally introduces randomness as a part of its creation process. What's interesting is that generative art dates back to 1960s and they were made by a few pioneers that were exploring the potential of computer generated imagery. And back then computers had no monitors. They took up the whole room. So artists can only see their art when it was printed on a large scale printers. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, quite a lot of these pioneers were women. So a lot of generated art was pioneered by women like Vera Molnar. Uh, and fast forward to the beginning of 21st century. And thanks to widespread of home computers, accessibility of tools like processing and open source community, generative art got more recognition. One of the subgenres that deserves our interest in is artificial intelligence, machine learning art that uses generative adversarial networks. 
for its creation. And NFTs have opened new possibilities for generative art, both for creating and selling. For example, art blocks stores the generative scripts on the blockchain for each of their project. So when the user buys an iteration of the project, they purchase uh, ERC721 that contains a probably unique seed that controls variables in this generative script. Uh, the example that you see is one of the most well-known of the early artworks of generative art. And here are a couple of other examples. And probably everyone knows Fidenza uh, that was made uh, last year. And this is, I, I think this guy is a bit less well-known, but not less interesting. He makes all these portraits with uh, generative art. Um, and here's the conclusion. And even although we mainly focused on artistic aspect of NFT, same thinking can be applied to other areas like gaming, metaverse, real estate, fashion, and so on. Many technological discoveries and innovations were frowned upon or laughed at by people who lived at the time, but later they became widely adopted parts of daily lives. And while some people believe that NFT market may be in a state of a bubble, uh, which partly it probably is, but NFT technology itself and what, or whatever it evolves into is most likely here to stay. And it's up to us to make the best of it. Uh, okay, I went <laughs> through it much faster than I thought I will. Um, so I feel like now is a good time to just uh, like ask questions, discuss, tell us what you think about everything. <laughs> snap, 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 clap, clap, clap. First off, incredible presentation. <laughs> I know that I'm like running this with you, but <laughs> I'm just like astounded because I thought it was the mirror board and then there were slides and I was like, dang, these slides are so good. Um, something really interesting that's come out recently that's news, uh, just like piggybacking off of generative art is that the US Copyright Office is making it that AI art cannot be copyrighted because it's not made by a human. And so there's just some weird stuff, regenerative art right now, but cool stuff for me. I just think it's really interesting, but. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel it's actually quite an interesting question because some people are saying, you know, that like generative art and computer-based art is made by machines, but it can't be made by machines. It's made by humans who write the script, yeah. it's made by humans who write the code and who control like. The curation of, the, of GAN the, set, like the, the data set for GAN is the art process, like of collecting all the images to source like, okay, Adam, you got a question. Yeah, we'll hand it over to you. Um, I've been working last year with some musicians who are doing machine learning and a lot of the sort of deep work that goes into that is obviously training data sets on existing music. So I'm wondering how the, this copyright law from the US Copyright Office is going to implicate on that because there's a real, you know, in music law, or when, it, when things go into, I, I used to work in music supervision a lot, and when things end up going to court related to music, what ends up happening is the decisions often made and sort of with the support of a musicologist who's paid a lot of money to be there. Um, but it normally comes down to the likeness of the track. So, for example, the case of um, Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines, which basically was a clear take on Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up. Is that? No, what's the track called? Anyway, oh, I can't remember the name of the track. But, um, and I remember hearing it the first time to me, holy shit, I know this, what is this? And then going on, anyway, and being like, wow, that sounds really close, but it's not. Anyway, they're lost in court and they settled with Marvin Gaye's state. But just as an example, so you can find really interesting machine learning based musical examples now where they've sort of matched Frank Sinatra with Britney Spears or something. And you can hear the elements of both tracks in there. So I'm curious whether that ever did go to court. Because, I mean, look, it's only going to go to court if someone's making money out of it. But, um, I imagine that's going to change. So do you have any links to that, the sort of copyright? Yeah, I, I, it's in the mirror board. And honestly, if you, okay, cool. up, I'll have a look. if you look up copyright, US, USCO, the US Copyright Office, AI, it's like a recent mm -hmm. thing. And it's honestly, Very like, interesting. I don't know if it's a precedent or anything as much as it's just like Dr. Steven Thaler had his copyright revoked. And like, honestly, there's 
a lot <laughs> said about copyright law that isn't that like chill or cool. Like, I don't know if you guys saw this story that happened in the last week, really dark, hate to take it to this place, but it was this guy who his daughter was killed and he doesn't have the copyright for the video of his daughter's murder. And he was trying to take it down. He's like, the only way that I can take this video down is through copyright strikes. And so in a last ditch effort to like try and get some sort of semblance over like this digital file that he has like no control over on the internet, he's minting it as an NFT to like claim ownership. It's a weird, all of this is just like crazy stuff that's happening right now. Proof of concept. I don't know. It's, it's crazy to me. And like, I don't have any answers. I have more questions than answers, but loose dots, you know, maybe you can connect them because I can't, <laughs> but uh, wow. isn't that, isn't that crazy? Isn't that wild? But yeah. I'll link yeah. I, I, I haven't heard about this story. Oh. I like, <laughs> but wow. Well. I'll post it right here. It was honest. Uh, wow. That was a weird link, <laughs> it's, uh, but it's no, it, and I don't really even understand the like meaning of it. Cause it's not like having an NFT inherently gives you copyright, but like yeah. extending the idea of ownership to like it's insane end is like, We'll see what happens. All of these are just precedent setters and like trailblazers and walking so we can run later on that type of energy. But like, kind of sad that like, I don't know, the copyright law is fucked, <laughs> which is, that's all I'm trying to get at is that it's like kind of weird. It, just a quick thought on that. Sorry, I don't want to linger too much on this, but um, I really think one of the reasons we're here and we're seeing this movement with Web3, it's a push against, push back against copyright law because copyright law is, they stifle innovation and um, they favor those who are in the right place at the right time to register these things. You know, I'll, I'll just speak about music again. Like, I mean, if you think about blues, you know, that came from Africa and merged in what, what, into what it is in America. But the people in the right place at the right time to register a piece of music that's, that's ultimately been created by hundreds of people over time, that melody perhaps evolved, you know, and no, none of the people are getting paid. But I mean, I think we're all on the same page with this, which is probably why we're on this call. But um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing that's being challenged now and this kind of shift in how we uh, consume and share value within that's, an intellectual property. You know? Like my, my basic thesis is that you can't un-technology technology, <laughs> like you can't uninvent something. And even if this goes nowhere, at least we're having the conversations about more equitable systems of distribution. Like <laughs> that's a good thing and a net positive. And if it takes us to a better place, like I'm so for that. And like, I don't really know much about technology in the first place. That's why I have a cultural guild. So like, if it's a roll up that wins or a, like a snarkware, I don't know these words, but like, cool. Like as long as it works towards more equitable steak like all these like good words and discussion points that are coming up like i think is really interesting i think right now it's like this is you have to do a lot of imagination like imagine what if like this was taken to a logical extreme because you know that's where we're at right now but that's fine i'm creative and like to think <laughs> i don't know um but kind of a dark topic that we spiraled into. Anyone have any other questions other than like? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I need to add the the part for copyright law on the mirror board and just this, yeah, like discussions about IP. But yeah, maybe <laughs> let's talk about something a bit more positive. I mean, there's really interesting like IP stuff. Um, and I have this in my presentation for the marketing thing about like co-creation of like collapsing the divide between the audience and the creator. But there's some really interesting like IP as an emergent phenomenon from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. And it's really interesting to see like, that's what I'm the most interested in is like IP as not like a static, but a dynamic phenomenon. And so I don't understand what that will look like, but it's something I'm really interested in. I don't know if anyone has any opinions on that, but that's my that's like where I take the IP conversation away from murder and stuff. <laughs> uh, I can um, jump in real quick. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, I'm fascinated by it as well. There's, I think, two sides of it. On one end, it's uh, certain collections obviously give you uh, some commercial uh, usage. So you as an individual or a group of individuals can get together and do something with that. I think that's fascinating. There's also the co-creation of that IP and call it chapter two or three with the community with the, and project. Um, I think that's really interesting. And as 
larger brands get into this space, especially those that have uh, like traditional, call it shows or movies, things like that. I think they're going to struggle with the concept of providing any kind of ownership to people uh, for IP that they've made millions, if not billions of dollars on forever. But um, I think they could and should be open to the idea of developing new IP with the same writers, you know, studio developers, et cetera, and co-develop that with the community. I think it's an interesting experiment for them uh, to you know, be native in Web3 with the same resources that they have um, and give people some share in that upside. Um, I think it's a low risk test for them that I'm sure people will do. Yeah, it reminds me like when Artifact launched the clones, like first they launched them and then they were like, oh, well, guys, but you won't own the IP for the ones that were made by uh, Murakami. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> They're the most expensive ones. So I feel like for me, it's slightly disrespectful to people who pay like a really big amounts of money to say to them, well, actually, no, you, you just own this pretty picture, but you can't do anything with it. And most people won't do anything with it. That's the thing. But just like this act of giving them IP for this exact image, I think it's just a right and generous thing to do. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, you have that debate with CryptoPunks right now and apes and things like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle, did you want to say something? Yeah, sorry. I, I don't know how to raise my hand on this thing. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Um, but uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say that the... Uh, I, I, something I don't really understand. Somebody on this call may understand much better than me. Is this difference between like the owning the IP and the actual like artwork, in the sense of like, uh, you, if you buy, you know, if you owned the Mona Lisa, that does not mean the physical artwork. That does not mean that you can sell mugs with Mona Lisa on it. If Da Vinci, you know, whoever Da Vinci like owns the IP behind it, right? And so, in some ways, I think the some of these conversations complete those two things. And, and it's actually a new way than uh, traditional artwork. I could not buy physical art necessarily unless that was granted through a separate contract and then like take a picture of it and sell t-shirts of it, right? And so I guess from my perspective, like some of these conversations about like what is owning the actual art versus the IP behind it, uh, we tend to think about them in NFTs as like one and the same when it's actually the like paradigm of the art world is it is separated in a way. Whether it needs to be is a different question. It's just like not, um, you know, I think it, it's different. I'll throw and something like, onto that. Sorry? I'll, I'll throw something onto that in case it's helpful. I, I think of it like property rights. When you buy a property, you don't always have mineral rights. So like there's different levels of rights associated with a property. Uh, just because you buy a property doesn't mean you can do absolutely anything with it. Um, so that to me is the closest corollary of at least how I think about it. Um, that brings it back to a traditional sense. Did you know you were speaking to someone that lives in Texas, Joel? <laughs> oh no <laughs> it's, very good. it's very good like you know uh, hey uh, i'm in arkansas so i'm right yeah, it, you. it makes sense to america it probably doesn't make sense to non-american but yeah yeah no, I, that's, a, uh, that's something you understand if well, you live tell me he's got oil underneath his no, no i do not <laughs> but but i i live in the state um <laughs> the uh yeah yeah exactly and the mirror Mur comment like the artifact thing i think is like a very good example where like uh when you talk about I'm interested to see how that conversation evolves over the next year between the IP and the ownership that's granted to NFT holders. Like me personally, as a collector of NFTs, I do not necessarily, I would be willing to sacrifice IP rights if I'm part of a community because I would trust, I trust Nike much more than board AP holders that are all around the world to increase the value of my ownership rights <laughs> in an NFT. And like different people have different incentives about what they want to do and the composability and like that decentralization is like somewhat against the ethos, but it's like, depending on what your incentive structure is, it's actually like, uh, there's different trade-offs people make and it'll be interesting to see how some of these communities evolve over the next year where it is very, uh, open and all rights are granted to everybody. Does that does that make those cultures more lasting, or does it make them uh, 
you know, some of them flame out. And I think that maybe there's multiple models that, you know, it's not like a winner take all. It's just uh, something I think about a lot when I see a lot of these uh, creative, you know, CCO like rights projects and they're put on everything. And it's like, that's great to an extent, but then like what happens when somebody uses that IP in a way that's like completely uh, not a way that anybody, you know, 95% of people wouldn't want to use. Does that just completely make those companies play out? So sorry, there's a lot that I've rambled on there, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think um, it's, like, there's a lot of different, different variables going on. And like, I don't know if the story has been fully written and it's good, but it's going to be interesting to watch it evolve over the next year or two years. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. Like, I feel like, for example, for one one art, it just doesn't make sense to give the IP. So it's like the, the comparison is good with traditional art world than like one one art. That's like, yeah, if you're an artist making a unique artwork, that is just like one of a piece, one of a kind, probably you should retain the IP for it. But like with the generative projects like CryptoPunks, I feel that the community brought so much more value to them than the original creators. So it's kind of like, greedy a bit on their side <laughs> not to give it away but yeah oh, just, yeah and i mean it's yeah crypto like I, I would with that example specifically it's like uh arguably yeah i don't i don't i don't know who it, but like <laughs> arguably doing nothing is the best way to drive value to crypto funds <laughs> from a centralized <laughs> perspective <laughs> yeah. i just had a thought um i mean i'm fascinated by cco and ways to try and monetize and bring value to makers through CCO. I mean, the best example I can think of is nouns, but that's kind of an anomaly. I um, mean, who knows who bought the first noun and inflated that first value point, you know, and that's kind of spiraled for all of them. But imagine we could build a fund and buy a really famous piece of art and then change the copyright on that piece of art and just give it to the world to do what they want with. It would be great, like Mona Lisa, but obviously we're not gonna buy that, but you know, just give it back and say, you guys do whatever you want with it. I mean, there are there's a lot of derivative stuff obviously coming out on various platforms um, of famous pieces and occasionally things are getting pulled, but um, it would be awesome to just flip a narrative on something that's very solidly rooted in human consciousness and the sort of canon of art that people consider to be a great piece. And, and, and on that as well, what you were saying, Joel, I think it'd be interesting, but I just can't foresee a big company like Disney ever doing that with any of their existing brands because inevitably the crypto community is just going to make filth with, say, Mickey Mouse or something. And <laughs> they, they don't want that, you know. They're definitely concerned. I mean, there's a reason Disney is on Vivi, right? It's a closed ecosystem. It gives them a sandbox to play in that it's safe. Um, I think it'll evolve, though. Like, uh, I've heard this conversation because I've had the conversation with a lot of people where they're concerned, like, what if they wear a Mickey Mouse hat and they do something inappropriate or whatever? Well, to me, it's the equivalent or similar to what if they post something negative on social media? Well, guess what? They will. <laughs> like, at some point, we're going to get past that conversation. But um, I totally get it. I understand. They're going to play in a closed ecosystem first, and then they're going to use that as an on-ramp to Web3, just like Nike and others are starting to get into Roblox first. That's their entry point. And I'm sure you all saw the BBC article about the sex clubs in Roblox three days ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Roblox is having a sex problem. It's crazy. And apparently a Nazi gas chamber as well. And then the, also with VR, this is a weird thing too. They're making personal space bubbles because there's been like sexual harassment in VR. Who knows, man? We're in a weird place right now. <laughs> I, just, I just know about these things. Um, a, a podcast that I threw in the chat that I'll probably throw in the Slack channel, just because like we were talking about Disney very briefly, Kings of IP. There was a former Disney executive who went on Overpriced JPEGs, which is an NFT podcast by Bankless. And he has a really cool perspective because his whole thing was IP development, like which franchises, how they activate like do they get a theme park do they get a broadway musical because their ip is so flexible and so really interesting to hear his perspective on nfts ip that type of stuff he can speak with that disney perspective that i don't have but a uh, good podcast to listen to if you're interested in that type of stuff yeah i think it also like intersects in the way with, with all this securities law that like you can't like sell nfts that promise you a certain amount because like if you own the co-own the ip like are you a 
like can you get like the the royalties and all the payments from this company and like right now i know like on NFTs, open c you can't sell the nfcs that promise this direct income so i, I feel this is also like a gray area that some people can be afraid of Uh, but yeah, we, we're coming close to one hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. That was a really good presentation and conversation and really good start to the guild. I really appreciate you co-leading this guild with me. It makes me look so good. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> it reflects so positively on me. Uh, no, but seriously, this is a really good talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to like, we've got an asynchronous space in the form of the Slack channel. Uh, on March 18th, I'm going to be doing marketing talks. Um, look forward to that <laughs> or look forward to the recording. You don't have to show up, show up if you have questions. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm so excited to have a culture guild. And once again, just like round of applause to Yulia on today's presentation, because that was really, 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 really good. And thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank oh, you for everyone. That? So the recording will be dropped into the Slack channel. Yeah, I don't know what I, I'm recording it right now. And this is the first guild. I don't know where I'm going to drop it. Like, I don't know if I have to reach out to someone, but it is recorded and I'm here to make sure that it, people can see it. So it will necessarily end up in its right place. I don't know where that is yet. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a Slack. It might, cool if, it might be cool if we could schedule a discussion time at like have an actual recording and then like afterwards have a different discussion time. This other people are probably dealing with this, but this is the first time I had to wake up at like 5 a.m. Yeah. Um, for one of these. Um, so the discussion would be cool if there could be like, just make it easier for. More than anything, people. like the guild is like these three calls that we have are the foundation upon which we build the guild itself. And so like that being said, like I work nine to five, Eastern time. And so that's why yeah. this is eight to 9 a.m. Eastern time, because it's before my work. But also, like, I feel like it's kind of a global curriculum. So, like, I want to make sure that people that are not, like, in Europe and, like, in other time zones also have the ability to show up. That being said, thank you for waking up at 5 a.m., dude. Like, hell yeah, man. Like, I'm sorry that that was annoying. And, like, I think that we should have more asynchronous connects. I think that we should have, you know, we have this space and we have the people and we have the right, like, you don't have to, like, catch up with so much like jargon like we understand what we're talking about so like these are the right people to connect with the questions you have happy to like create that space and hold that space for everyone and looking forward to what we come up with definitely do conversations and like make use of more than just these talks themselves because you know hey we're all each other's resources we are in each other's environments is the like first lesson from kernel so yeah yeah and, and thank you again everyone who came here <laughs> and dedicated this hour a few days to this session um yeah we're gonna drop the mirror board in the slack again and uh i would be glad to see you sharing the inspiration there too and i'm gonna i'm saving the chat and i'll drop that in so each chat will i'll drop in the, the culture guild afterwards and i will share the recording i mean there or wherever it's supposed to go i'm recording it so it was recorded i, I think we need to talk to the stewards it should yeah, be I'm talk to the <laughs> yeah. okay yeah. bye everyone thank you so much we really appreciate later. it we'll see you guys bye bye or so <laughs> later bye